The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will visit three remarkable nooks of Europe in search of miracles of nature. To begin with, we will venture into Austria's Salzburg region, an area that's famous for its Alps and Tower Mountains, but also because it's the birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. After that, we will move over to the southwestern outpost of the old continent, to Portugal's Algarve region. To conclude, we will admire Corsica, the French island of beauty. Salzburg is a region saturated with salt, so to speak. It is an area filled with many myths and tales. A gate to other worlds, where fairies dance in the deep forests and dwarves mine for treasure beneath the mountains. It is said that ghosts live by the Krimler waterfalls on the Krimler Ach in the High Tower National Park. The Krimler waterfall is the highest waterfall in Austria, hurtling down into a 400 meter deep abyss. In wintertime, when the surrounding mountains transform into an ice kingdom, some 500 cubic meters of water flow through the waterfall every hour. In the summertime, this number multiplies by 40. A road follows the Krimler waterfall south to Italy and to west to the Tyrol region. Legend has it that when passing here, one should toss a coin into the water for good luck. Andreas Kammerlander, a very distinctive wood carver who specializes in carvings of forest spirits, lives in the village of Wald in Pinskau, not far from the waterfalls. Occasionally, he also works on smaller pieces. The soft timber of the pine growing at an altitude of 1,700 meters has a lovely scent. Apparently, it also has healing properties because it slows the heart rate. Andreas also has another passion, mining. Copper, precious stones, salt, and other minerals have been quarried in the area from the time of the Celts. Andreas, together with a few buddies, bought the rights to mine an old shaft. There are fluorite deposits here which come in blue, green, purple, even brown and black. A little further on, in the Habachtal Valley, they specialize in mountain crystal. There were no crystal deposits on their land, so they had it brought in by helicopter. This block is made up of a cluster of smaller crystals. The largest that was ever extracted here weighed 120 kilos. In Habachtal, there is also Europe's only emerald deposit. The largest emerald ever found here weighed 42 kilos and forms a part of the British crown jewels. The emerald mines lie at an altitude of 2,200 meters. The deep green precious stones are hand peeled out of the belt gneiss. Mr. Steiner learned to find emeralds from his parents. The seeker must possess, above all, an excellent intuition as well as a thorough knowledge of local nature. Mr. Steiner not only finds the emeralds, he also polishes them and designs jewelry. The 
dominant feature of the Durenberg region on the Austro-German border is the duo of the Barmstein rocks. The one on the left is in Germany, and the one on the right belongs to Austria. Beneath lies a rich deposit of salt. Salt production today is no longer as profitable as it once was. Even so, it still gets busy on occasion because the salt mine in the town of Helein has been converted into a museum. The salt is extracted using water by flooding the shaft, then pumping it out to be further processed at the surface. The mine is slowly collapsing though. The old wooden beams need replacing to prevent visitors from ending up as the salt man did. He was discovered in 1732. The salt mummified him perfectly and thus he was preserved. Perhaps he got lost or his light went out. Without light, a miner cannot work or survive. In the past, the only source of light were wooden torches, miners' lamps, or candles. The state borderline drawn in the mine indicates that order must be maintained underground as well as the surface. Here, we can see a proper salt vein. But let us now catch our train ride back into the daylight of the surface. The Untersberg mountain range in Salzburg is heavily entwined with local tales and fables. Water from the Grasselhole source is said to have healing properties. In the past, archbishops from Salzburg were known to have this water brought to them. In any case, the source still supplies Salzburg with drinking water. The locals claim there is a cave just above the source in which there's a gate to different places and times. One of the many legends says that in the 16th century, wedding guests passed through this cave into the church, but they never made it there. Instead, they reappeared right here out of nowhere a hundred years later. The Celts who lived in this area were great specialists in geomancy, the interpretation of markings on the ground they were particularly careful when choosing plots for their temples. This was an important task done according to the Earth's energy. In places where Celtic shrines once stood, today there is usually a church. The structures are therefore charged with powerful energy forces. The church in the town of Sankt Wolfgang near the Wolfgang See Lake also stands on a spot abundant in energy. Salzburg is Austria's fourth largest city. It lies on the river Salzach, not far from the boundary with Germany. Salzburg became wealthy because of salt. Local archbishops who were in charge of the mining invested generously in the city's development, and thanks to it, Salzburg bloomed into unprecedented beauty. It also became world-renowned as the city of music, especially thanks to its famous native, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who was born in this exact home on Getried Gasse. The center is crisscrossed by droshkis that stand close to the horse fountain. The city's most famous religious building is the Salzburg Dome. The Salzburg panorama is dominated by the massive Hohen Salzburg Fortress, which stands proudly above the city on top of the Monksberg. The forever snow-capped giants of the Alps and the lush green pastures on the foothills are also part of the unmistakable character of the Salzburg region. It is time though to head off to the end of the world, to Portugal's Algarve.
The southernmost part of Portugal, the province of Algarve, has forever attracted the attention of foreigners as well as locals. As far back as 3,000 years, Phoenician merchants were lured here by great business prospects. The Phoenicians were then replaced by Carthaginians, Romans, Visigoths, and Arabs. Its position on the southeastern outpost of Europe made it a place of great strategic importance. The castle in the town of Silves is a typical example of Moorish influence, even though its foundations were laid by the Romans in the fourth century. Silves was the capital of Algarve in the times of Moorish rule. It was, above all, a symbol of resistance against the Reconquista. In other words, the religious as well as ethnic hatred of the Christian inhabitants of the Pyrenean Peninsula toward Arabs. It was rid of barbarian rule by King Don Sancho I in 1198 after a very long siege. Sancho's victory, however, was not absolute. The Catholic commanders fought the Moors over Algarve for the next 50 years. When you take a good look around in the town of Tavira, you will realize that a strong Arab imprint was left behind. The roofs are one example. It was an Arab invention that survived the Reconquista. It's a system which, through its four-sided construction and slightly bent profile, ensures better circulation and therefore cooler air. The southwestern coast of Portugal was considered the end of the world in the Middle Ages. It is understandable that seamen and explorers of the time had a great desire to discover whether there really was nothing out there. The lighthouses were meant to show them the way home. One such lighthouse stands on the Cape of St. Vincent on the southwesternmost outpost of Europe. Its light can be seen 95 kilometers away. Every 15 seconds, it emits a ray of light to one of the three cardinal points facing toward the sea. The waves of the Atlantic relentlessly wash over the coastal rocks, creating bizarre formations that have forever teased the imagination of the locals. The appeal of the local coastline was initially discovered in the 1960s by the Brits, who were the first to start coming here in modern history. Currently, the British also dominate the local tourism industry. The rugged coastline that once helped the Portuguese to protect their territory is ironically now the biggest draw for most of the foreigners. Algarve offers 270 kilometers of Atlantic coastline, offering countless lovely hidden coves. The wild waves that once shaped the coastline today draw surfers from all over Europe. da água portuguesa. In other words, the Portuguese water dog. It is a special fisherman's breed emerging in the 15th century. In the past, this dog was a proficient helper capable of pulling various objects from the water, and it's been known to save many a fisherman's life. It's long been used in hunting, but families with the smallest of children often use this friendly, hardworking, and very intelligent dog for a companion. The eastern coast of Algarve has an entirely different character, as well as an entirely different technique for acquiring seafood. The perfect time for collecting the conquila mussels comes at low tide. Many end up on the dinner tables of local homes and restaurants, but the smallest, and therefore the youngest mussels, are always returned to the sea and allowed to grow to a proper size.
These sandbanks are unattractive to tourists, but are ideal for the extraction of sea salt. In Algarve, salt is being extracted from June through September. There is hardly any rain during this period, and the temperatures hover around 30 degrees Celsius. The locals stick to the traditional techniques. They utilize a complex system of salt pans known as salinas, and the whole process functions as its very own ecosystem. Many protected birds nest here, for example. Of course, salt is also extracted industrially, but such salt is of a considerably lower quality. The decisive factor in the quality of salt is the time allowed for the salt to crystallize. Mr. Manuel da Bento collects the so-called fleur de sel, salt flowers. This is the highest quality of salt in the world, and it comes in the form of fresh crystals that literally blossom on the water's surface. Industrial salt is permitted to evaporate much longer, and so larger crystals form. The fleur de sel contains a lot of minerals that are beneficial to our health, such as iodine, magnesium, and potassium. Whenever the salt crystallizes longer, the ratio of minerals decreases, and what remains is not a particularly healthy sodium chloride. Another special trait of the fleur de sel is its pinkish hue. Special microorganisms containing beta-carotene are present in the water, and this accounts for that specific coloring. Algarve is not just coastal. When heading north, one soon reaches a totally different landscape characterized by rolling highlands. The Rio Guadiana forms a natural border with Spanish Andalusia in the east. It is favored as a peaceful inland port, often used by maritime ships. Anchoring in the village works out cheaper than at the marina, and here, the ships are protected from the destructive forces of the ocean. The Serra do Calderao and Monchique mountain ranges separate Algarve from the neighboring Alentejo. Because its peak reaches 1,000 meters above sea level, the mountain range is the main cause of the sunny seaside climate. The clouds chased from continental Europe are stopped by the jutting peaks and so the bad weather seldom makes it to the southern coast. Looking at the mountain range, one must think that Mother Nature was not particularly fair. While the seaside port of Algarve is guaranteed good weather because of the mountain range, the mountains themselves come across as a sad wasteland. Only cork oaks and pines thrive here. The locals live off collecting the cork oak bark and pastoral farming. A herd of goats is seen here grazing on the peak of the Foya Mountain, Algarve's highest point. Algarve was a prominent producer of wheat in the past. The windy climate was often utilized in the harvest process. There were mills on virtually every hill. The snow white facade indicates that the mill is kept spick and span. A much more common sight in Algarve today is an electric energy windmill, and so the tradition of using the wind's energy remains, although it has taken on a modern appearance. Now, we are headed to the Isle of Beauty, to Corsica. These peaks are to be seen on one of the strangest of the Mediterranean islands. Corsica bestows its beauty on seaside lovers and passionate hikers alike. The island has a very emotional past. For centuries, it has been the home to proud and unconquered natives. One of them, Monsieur Pasquale de Paoli, 
has helped achieve Corsica's independence, which lasted 14 years. After that, France acquired the island for good. The town of Corte was the center of the resistance and later became the capital of the Free Republic of Corsica. The citadel above the town is the island's only fortress that is not built on the coast. It was built by the Genovese in the 15th century and the locals call it Eagle's Nest. Corsica is also known as L'Ile de Beauté, meaning the Isle of Beauty. Apparently, beauty can take on many forms. In Corsica, it's not just sunny beaches, but also steep peaks and streams with crystal cool water coming down from the glaciers. The highest, Monte Sintu, is 2,706 meters high, and some of its peaks remain snow-capped all year round. Despite the often harsh climate, the conditions favor farming. The cultivation of citrus fruits, olives, and wine is restricted to the lowland areas on the coast, while the higher areas are used for livestock farming. Corsica is the poorest European region belonging to France. Whenever a wealthier Frenchman darts to one of the local picturesque stone villages, he may believe that he has entered a folk museum. Judging by the visitor numbers, though, it's apparent that this charm amid virgin nature really draws tourists. The Nustrale pig is bred especially for the renowned prosciutto ham and the figatello sausage. The piglets are fed extra wheat middlings and hulled grains in their first year, and the older specimens are left to roam freely. During this time of the year, they feed almost exclusively on chestnuts and acorns. On the southern cape of the island, near the Strait of Boniface, which separates Corsica from Sardinia, are the island's only limestone cliffs falling steeply into the sea. Here, the picturesque Bonifacio settlement was established. In the early times of Christianity, it was known as Calcosalto, which stands for Chalk Haven. It was most likely called so because nature has created a safe natural harbor here. Because the island is lined with steep cliffs, this land was almost undefeatable from the sea. The island's rulers have built massive fortresses in the few places where safe landing was possible. Citadels dominate the towns of Ayaccio, Bonifacio, and Bastia. Today, the coast is guarded only by flags boasting a moor's head, the symbol of Corsica. All approaching tourists are aware that they are about to disembark on the Isle of Beauty because no matter which direction one arrives from, the welcoming spectacle is always breathtaking. The hidden beaches attract hordes of tourists in the summertime because no one can resist the harsh charm of the Isle of Beauty. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will visit two islands, Mauritius and the Seychelles. On Mauritius, we will find out that although many rare animals are long extinct, there is still plenty to explore. The Seychelles are the home to giant tortoises and uncommon plants possibly the scarcest animal species in the world though, live in southern Kivu. The mountain gorillas are a very rare and extremely endangered species. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us. <laughs>